Um, so yesterday we had a first workshop and uh, we looked at uh, Google Earth Metaverse and Roslyn, which is um, US development's own in development, uh, own 3D all purpose uh, online um, web, uh, which is kind of quite interesting. Uh, so I hadn't actually intended to record the, uh, the workshops, um, but I did record it by default and it sounded like people were keen to watch it. So I have um, uploaded it and put the link there. Um, and I'll, I'll do the same today because um, there's a lot more people that uh, registered that, that have uh, then have turned up particularly to the workshops. So I think that's probably a useful thing. It also means that, um, you know, Mitch and Meredith and whoever else is putting their valuable time into it. Um, hopefully you get a bit more exposure <laughs> beyond uh, the uh, four, or five, four or five people join us live. So is that okay for everyone? I record the session and, and host it later. Also means, you know, if you found something really interesting, you can come back to it later. So today, what we're looking at, um, and we've changed the order because I have asked um, Meredith and Mitch at the very last minute um, uh, to give us a bit of an overview of some of their experiences with SeekBeak. So we're going to look at SeekBeak first because Meredith has to head off. Um, but then also have a bit of a look and a bit of a play of Mozilla Hubs, um, which I think is a really interesting space in virtual reality because it's a collaborative space. Um, and as we've been discussing over the last few days, most VR experiences tend to be solo experiences. And so you, you lose all that rich learning uh, around, you know, social constructivism, um, which, uh, you know, you do in a social space. So, I think it's really interesting, some of the potential around something like Mozilla Hubs and the other key there is the low technical entry into that, which is fantastic. Uh, and the other area I wanted to quickly go over was Google Street View, which just because it's a really simple way to start creating some of your own um, 360 degree spherical imagery content that you can use in these other platforms, um, particularly if the only device you have is a smartphone, which uh, is quite possibly uh, your students. Um, there's probably not many of them that own a 360 degree camera as such. So what can you do with your smartphone and start creating your own content? So that's kind of why we're looking at Street View and, and uh, Google Local Guides. So let's um, start by getting into SeekBeak. If you click the SeekBeak link there, it should take you to um, basically to the SeekBeak login page, which once again, I'll also copy and paste it into the chat. So here it is. It's um, just as it says in the can, SeekBeak, S-E-E-K-B-E-A-K.com. Uh, it's a web-based virtual reality, um, mobile friendly and device agnostic. In fact, the first time I signed up for a SeekBeak was actually on my um, iPhone on the train on the way home. And I started creating my first SeekBeak environment on my phone. And as you can see, it has a free version, so you can sign up for free. So I'd recommend if you haven't done that before to sign up for free. Um, the key with most of these platforms is that you need to use a real email address to sign up because they will want to authenticate that you're human via your email address before your account is active. Uh, and then once you're signed up and log in, the entry page kind of looks a bit like this. There's, there's not a lot there to start with, um, but you have these, these sort of two main areas that uh, I, I guess are the, are the main elements of SeekBeak. So they, they define a virtual environment as a snap. I'm not sure why, but a snap is a one virtual environment. And for free, you can create three snaps and link them, interact between them, etc. And if three isn't enough for the activity that you're wanting to create, you can sign up with another email address and get another three and uh, link them that way. Um, so certainly that's what we've done with students in the past. And uh, you can get a whole 
team environment with, with you know, if you've got a team of students, they can all be signing up and then linking between their snaps. Um, you can create folders. So uh, you can see this is um, I'm piggybacking on the account for the paramedic project that we have running for a number of years. So that's why this paramedicine and, and clinical health core hub, et cetera. Um, but you can create folders for organizing all your various snaps, et cetera, if you've got um, you know, a full account. Um, and this particular account is, I think is the second tier or something like that. So there's some features we don't have, but it gives us most of the features. Uh, the interesting thing with the free account is they give you access to all of the features for free. They just limit the number of snaps you have. So you can try out all the features, uh, including their um, marketing and online shop uh, and the internet of things, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> they keep adding to it. So they now have uh, maps, which is uh, more like a 2D clickable link and you can create virtual tours using maps. Um, Groups allows you to uh, create teams of people. Um, I think that's probably mainly for the paid accounts. And then the reports give you feedback on the interaction on your environment. So um, the selector reports such as, uh, just to show you very quickly, say a hot pots uh, click report, then we can choose from one of the spaces that's go core hub we can choose the actual environment the, the snap that we want to check out let's do that one uh, we can do a date span if we want to and let's just go first of february to the third gives us a report so over those three days there's been uh, two uh, hotspots activated, etc. cetera. Um, maybe because people aren't currently looking at it, but uh, the, the reports give you a lot of feedback on interaction. And so we've certainly used this around uh, things like uh, you can have a heat map. Um, they've put that into the next level up now, um, but the heat map's really interesting. It's basically eye tracking. So you can see where people have been looking within your virtual environment and it gives you a colored map uh, responding to that. So lots of ways that you can get feedback and analysis of the interaction with the environments you created. Um, so if I just quickly go into how to get started and then I'll flick over to, to Meredith and Mitch to give us a demo of what they've done with it. Um, Going to go into my demo space again, just so I don't mess up everyone else's work. You can see there it says um, the snaps are equi-rectangular uh, images. So it's a 360 image that's been spread out flat in that particular format. So any image that's in that format, you can import into your, um, into your snap. Um, and if you import a not complete uh, equi-rectangular image, it will stretch it. And so you can get some interesting, uh, interesting looking environments if you haven't done a full 360 spherical image. Um, but then again, if you don't have a camera or don't have time, you can just click on the, uh, the source material here and here are a whole bunch of copyright free images that you can grab and uh, start off with. Um, so let's just grab one, this one there. And it's a pretty low res one, but you could download it, save it somewhere. And we could import it into our snap. Go back. So when we click on create a snap, um, the first thing you want to do is bring in your image. Um, oh, it's so does HTML. Okay. So it has a wrong type. Oh, oh, that's an image from a article. So let's try something else. Okay.
Obviously, I should have done this earlier, but there you are. Try, try copy image. Yeah, I think I've got it this time. <laughs> so there we go. Upload it into our snap. You can give it a name. Um, oops. And I won't worry with all that for the moment. <clears throat> so it's just processing it very quickly. Shouldn't take too long. It's not a high res photo. So we click on it. That's basically our background now. And you can have a look around. It's a looks like an old Roman aqueduct. Um, and your control panel is just down the bottom. So that's still sort of pulling that image in a bit. You've got your edit properties, which gives you some basic properties that you can change, including um, where the uh, field of view is to start with. So you can uh, define where people look by default to start with uh, as the starting point inside the image. So you can point them towards, say you've got a 360 of a, of a performance venue, Solange and a stage, you can make them look directly at the stage if you want to, to start with, etc. cetera. Um, so you can change all of those types of properties, then to edit, to make it interactive, you click into edit mode, um, can go full screen if you like. And then the, you basically add hotspots by clicking the plus, choose a hotspot and then locate it somewhere. And by double clicking it, we can choose the type of hotspot. So it can link to uh, any URL uh, it can activate your email uh, program. So you can you know, start an email. Uh, you can play an audio file. So you can upload like an MP3 or, or um, you know, uh, an appropriate audio format. Uh, you can have a pop-up image. You can start a telephone call. Um, you can make it uh, flare so it's uh, more obvious you can actually hide the hotspots as well. So it can be more like an adventure. So they're in invisible and people have to look around and mouse over to try to find stuff that's interactive. Um, a snap means that it's going to jump to another one of your um, snaps or VR environments. Uh, a form is just what it says, the form. So you can have some interaction and feedback via um, a form that you, you create. So it could be like a survey or a little formative assessment for your students, etc. And if you've got some embed code from uh, another site like YouTube or any, anything that's got embed code, you can embed it as an object into your environment as well. The one that I think is really quite exciting, which I haven't really seen any examples of yet, is uh, the, the signal. So effectively, the, the signal is um, Internet of Things, where if you have an actual physical device, and you can change icons and stuff like that, um, <clears throat> say like a Wi-Fi uh, thermometer, uh, you can ping that via the, uh, the Internet of Things code and you can copy and paste that in uh, down the bottom here. Uh, and you can poll it from your virtual environment. And so you can get, actually get this interaction between the virtual environment and the real world. So suddenly it becomes actually, you know, you're bridging the virtual and, and the physical world with the Internet of Things. Um, so you could click on a, a, a you know, a, a virtual thermometer in your world here, which gets the real temperature from a real thermometer that's Wi-Fi activated and pull it into the scene uh, in real time. Um, you know, you, maybe you could turn a toaster on or start your Nespresso machine or whatever, you know, um, quite interesting. Anyway, so that's basically what you do is you start putting all these hotspots around and you make your world interactive. Um, so it's, it's relatively simple. I think that's, that's the beauty of the thing. Um, and of course, you have to remember to save. Uh, and then what you wanna do when you're finished is share. Uh, so you get these various options for sharing. Uh, looks like it's gonna generate a QR code now, that's new. Um, takes a snapshot, so uh, you can obviously copy the link and email it, you can tweet it, Facebook it, put it on LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
So that's the lightning tour of the editing interface. I'm going to hand over to Meredith and Mitch to talk us through some of the projects they've actually used Seekbeck for. Just unmute myself. <laughs> um, just to continue, the, we've got a bit of a theme going around France example, French examples in, a, in the chat. So I'm going to continue on with that and talk you through um, the Seekbeck examples that uh, we did for a subject that's called In the Heart of the Loire Valley. So this is a, a French subject that's offered at second and third year. Um, it's normally offered uh, well, in situ in France. And now they've moved to, with what's happened, they've moved to a model where there's a fully online version. And I think that's, you know, obviously going to stay for a while um, or indefinitely. So we were really looking at ways that we could utilise the materials that the teaching staff had and just make the online environment richer for students. So um, when they're in situ in the Loire Valley, they do a whole lot of site visits to different castles and they have talks by curators, um, experts, they have activities and things they, they do. And we were trying to find a way that we could just make not really simulate exactly the curators because we didn't have access to that material, but at least make a start in moving in that direction and make the environment, you know, a little bit more experiential for students. So we were literally taking the photos that the teaching staff had and they were panoramic photos that have been, where possible, taken on, on their phones. Um, and we also, you know, looked for what we could use that was royalty free. And there's sites like um, 360 Cities and other other sites we do as well. So they're a little bit rough and ready. Have also would be the best, and the next can then add to this material themselves. So those are a little bit rough and ready. I'm still here, it's just my internet seems to be going slow. Okay, so it looks like um, looks like we're back. <laughs> can you, vagaries, can vagaries you, of the internet. Can you promote me to share my screen? Oh yeah, that might help, won't it? Yeah, sorry about that. Fantastic, thank you. Here we go. Okay, so I'm just going to start by showing you some of the planning we did. And again, this is a little bit um, rough and ready because we were doing this, you know, fairly, fairly fast paced on the fly and we were literally using what examples we had. So rather than a more intentional planned learning design approach, we were basically reverse engineering this around just what we could achieve in the time that we had. So um, we kept... rapid prototyping. Yes, um, we had, we're very lucky. We had a fantastic multimedia intern student um, at the, the time, who unfortunately we don't no longer have, have but um, Grace Wilson did a lot of work with me on this and we we're literally sitting side by side and that worked quite well. So we kept a track of what we we're doing uh, just very simply in here, thinking through the different elements that we had. So we've got this color coding here and just thinking through a bit of the, the approach here and that this is really what we were communicating with the consulting with the teaching staff about and sort of working through that with what we could find. And then um, we were just for our own purpose, keeping a, a record here of the, the different site visits. So we ended up making these six different sort of self-paced tours that things hang off. So I'll stop sharing that and show you some I think examples. that was quite a nice idea or it is a bit of a, template, design template, Meredith, um, 
you know, if you were able to maybe even share that as, as an example, perhaps on the Padlet as a yeah. okay. you know, Google Doc or a Teams Doc or something. Yeah, because at the same time, we we're also videoing some short interviews with the teaching staff, um, all in French. Um, and so other team members, Sam and our team, was doing a lot of work uh, recording high quality videos, inserting a lot of multimedia images, uh, rich text images and things in there as well. So there was quite a lot going on that we were trying to build the LMS at the same time. Okay, so I'm just sharing this screen now. So um, this is the basic interface. You've already seen Tom's run through that, but this is where you've got your 360 locations, snaps organized within a group. So this is Alawa Valley Group. I'll just quickly show you some examples. So this one here is uh, Chateau Bois, which we've got a mix of, of text and media in here. So this is um, an image that the teaching staff had that we've just brought in. And then we've just added things off here. And we've added in yeah, hotspots and things depending on the type. So down here, as Tom's already gone through, you've got a little panel here where you can basically control things so you can add a, a new thing in here if you want um this this one goes off to another snap that's the interior of Amboise um, we've got here this is um actually a, a quiz that we embedded in there that we used another tool to create and we've just added that that code in there so yeah so literally you just go through and you sort of just add things obviously you know kind of trying to think why you're doing these and the learning design context around that. We were quite ambitious initially. We really, uh, we'd seen that there were escape rooms for some of these castles and we got really excited thinking, oh, what can we do with, you know, with kind of planning through some of that. Um, one of these has got an assassination scene. I can't remember which, I was trying to find it before, but um, it's a great, yeah, video that we just linked to in the end, but we were going to try to work out, you know, have this kind of tour where students had to work out where the king was assassinated, but yeah, we didn't quite get there. Um, anyway, it was a start. So some of these have got, you know, links to other things going on in there. And you can see this is, yeah, you can either, um, let's cancel out of that. You just either um, add or edit from within here and you get your, box of things to do up here um, and as yes, Tom mentioned these are changing all the time so some of them weren't around when we were working on this. Um, what else can I show you? Something interesting. So yeah so we've linked out to um, other videos and other material that exists in there. Um, Have you got yeah. um, students as projects to create their own environments? We haven't with this one yet. Um, I think that was the intention they were going to do that, but, but I think they ended up just recording videos of themselves kind of talking about different things instead. Yeah, so we haven't gone that far yet, but that will be the next extension of this. So um, yeah, so this one jumps into a view of the, the castle itself. This is actually the academic here, Veronique Duche. So, and then yeah, you can, you can click into various things and so, you can see the stitching of, of some of it's a little bit, you know, crazy, but it's kind of the best we could do and it's better than nothing. So it gives students at least an opportunity to explore the environments for themselves. Um, that one also jumps into a view from the castle. Yes, yeah, so I think that's where if you have access to a 360 degree camera, then your source imagery is going to be a lot better because yeah. um, the stitching is normally done either in the app or if you've got a multi-camera uh, 360 degree camera you you do a lot more editing etc um, yeah. but it comes down to cost and time we'd probably give the teaching staff a camera to take with them when they want to travel to France again I think it could be a good way of going in terms of how we integrated this in the LMS so we've embedded the seat beaks within the modules within the LMS. So this is the subjects canvas page from um, the winter intensive that was uh, obviously in the middle of last year. And so that you can see there's the six different places here and the modules. And 
and then this um this visit so we've got that as the same kind of structure for each of the modules and it just jumps in there and then students can click on that and there they are they're looking at it from a student's perspective so as i say they're pretty rough and ready but it was what we could do within the time that we had and i think it's at least better than nothing and there are activities around scaffolded around that in the module there's you know vocab lists and things we had activities also in padlet where they had to construct vocab lists as they went and then comment on which castle uh, you know do a bit of a comparison of castles and things in there as well so that's yeah that's that's really the example um and do anyone would like to ask any questions about that Um, Meredith, I have a question. Um, so, do I, do I understand correctly? This was put in place of the actual site visit, or the students yes, of that so, um, whole subject. Um, this is like an alternative to the students undertaking the subject traveling to France and undertaking it in situ in France in the Loire Valley. So, the topics are a little bit different. They normally, um, I think, they actually do a lot more, um, but. For the online version it was paired back to just six six sites that are covered yeah so, so i mean the next step would really be if um teaching staff took a 360 camera or if they recorded some of the curators talks and things and then that can be embedded in or there's an activity design maybe with the students who do get to go to france whenever that might be could help to build out resources that then if they wanted to keep going with the online version they can you know Learning more learning materials will be added. Um, are we going to run into ethics issues if we just position a camera in a public space in Europe and start taking? Well, the curators for the for the site tours with the students are all booked, so it's all actually worked out in advance. So obviously, permission mm -hmm. would have to be okay. sought, and the university's A and B consent forms all filled in, and, and all of that. Yeah. Okay. Or I guess you know, last year I was thinking there could be ways of doing this on Zoom with getting curators to still present to students um, and that could be recorded and added as a hotspot so lots of different options so that's that's, uh, that's an issue that um, google's thought about as well so with street view um, when, you, when you're using the street view app to create your spherical uh, imagery the the environment um, you can blot out faces and smudge out faces and, and number plates and stuff like that um, so yeah, there's there's ways of approaching those sort of ethical issues if that, if that's a problem. So a bit of editing in your in your in your environment, um, you know, if someone accidentally wanders in and gets captured, and uh, you can smudge out their face, etc. Mm -hmm. Good Mary question, though. It's launch. Sorry, <laughs> um, you, 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 there are sort of 3D captures that I know of various spaces. Uh, what would be the advantage of importing one of those into this application, Stickbeak, as opposed to just uploading it into Canvas? Is it is it this interactivity? Is the fact? Yeah, that yeah. The 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 advantage is the interactivity. So if a 360 degree image. Um, and the same with 360 degree video, uh, it's, it's just a passive experience. The only control the user has is of where they're looking. So by bringing that into SeekBeak, suddenly you can make that a whole lot more interactive. Um, you can add much more pedagogical sort of design around it. You know, what are you trying to achieve? Uh, if you don't have, uh, you know, interactive hotspots, et cetera, in there, then It'll, it's probably going to be a bit like a museum visit for school kids. They'll, they'll spend two minutes looking around, get bored, then go somewhere else, um, mm -hmm. end up yeah. at the tuck shop. You know? It's more experiential because the students themselves are exploring the environment. Yeah. The ones that I've shown you are very simple. But, you know, if, if you can imagine something that was like an escape room where you've got all different options and things and some goals that students have to achieve, something they've got to find out, and then... You know, you could design a really great activity around that and really, you know, the importance of it being experiential. 
mm. um, really add to the learning. And where, where I see the real power of it is, is uh, as a tool for student creativity. Uh, it's very low entry level as far as the technology goes. If you can use, you know, Microsoft Word, you can use SeekBeak. Um, and uh, if you can use your smartphone, you can capture the content. So um, it's, it's a great way of getting students who aren't techie uh, into creating these sorts of spaces. I've, I put into the chat an example of uh, we used uh, a project with journalism students uh, two years ago where the project was to create an interactive tour of the newsroom. And so, you know, we just created these teams of journalism students and none of them were techie, but they created these, you know, really cool interactive tours. Mitch, you wanted to say something? I was going to say something along the same lines, actually, Thomas, that um, yesterday we were talking about how Google Cardboard Camera creates these really nice, um, seamless, um, cylindrical panoramas, which are, you can't really use in very many things, but you can use them in SeekBeak. And it's a way of escaping them out of, um, out of the Google um, silo, in a sense. Um, and of course, all you need is a swivel chair and you can either do it yourself or you can have someone do it, you know, do it with you, but you can get an almost perfect cylindrical panel just by holding a camera or an iPad and spinning and it's surprisingly good. Yeah, good tip, Mitch. I think the, the key is trying to keep your position within that environment as still as possible when you're taking it with a single lens because it's stitching. Um, the other key is trying to choose environments where you don't have um, vertical lines or horizontal lines that are very close to the camera because they're incredibly hard to stitch. Um, so just sort of thinking about the environment, the other one to, to think about with any sort of 360 degree imagery or video is where's the sun um, <laughs> and getting glare from lighting. Um, it's virtually impossible to avoid unless you position the camera in shade somewhere. So, you know, there's a few basic sort of procedural things you kind of learn along the way as you, as, as you start doing this sort of stuff. And, and Meredith, so any of your students that had the, the luck of having a, a pair of uh, uh, VR glasses, would they be able to experience these settings with the glasses or not? No, this is just purely to embed within the LMS. Yeah, yeah with SeekBeak you can. Um, if you, it depends on the device you're viewing the environment and so it's context dependent. So if you were viewing that on your phone, um, then SeekBeak recognizes that it's a mobile device that's, that's viewing it. Uh, it's, you know, pinging it as a mobile browser and it pops up a little cardboard icon so you can go into cardboard mode and it splits the screen left and right um, and you can then put your phone into a Google Cardboard compatible device to get the immersive um, environment. And then it uses gaze to activate the hotspots. And you can set that in your properties. Um, I didn't show you that, but in the properties of SeekBeak, you can set how long the gaze is to activate a hotspot. I think it defaults to three seconds. And so when you're in Google Cardboard mode on a mobile device in a, in a uh, cardboard compatible headset, um, you don't get that option when you're on a computer because it, it you know, knows you're on a computer and therefore it's just a flat screen, mouse around interface. You don't get that cardboard option pop up. Um, but on your mobile device, you get a dot, a central dot. And as you move around, that dot moves with you with your gaze. And when you hover that dot over, an, over a hot spot for more than whatever the activation period is, three seconds, it, it's like a mouse click and will activate that hot spot and whatever the, the activity is will happen. Um, so it's actually really simple and it works really well, quite, quite uh, intuitive. That's, that's the same tech that we use in, in Dookie VR and 4D farms. So it's within KR Pano, but it's the same general concept. So the students can move around the farm by gaze uh, and then look, they look down at their feet to actually move through time, backwards or forwards through time. Um, whereas on the computer, computer screen, you have a flashing widget which you click on. Yeah, so, you know, it's a much more immersive experience when you're in... Um, Google Cardboard mode. Um, you just got to be careful of 
the length of time for those types of experiences because there's no biometric feedback with Google Cardboard. Uh, and so you're likely to get um, motion sickness, you know, with anything beyond say 10 minutes or so experience. And of course, people, if they're moving around, might bang into objects in the room or each other. <laughs> so there's those sorts of issues. Okay, my internet seems to be going slow again. You've all kind of frozen for me, unfortunately. I just want to share something with you, um, which is another little example. Won't really go into it too much, but on this page, which is just a kind of a junk um, blog site that I have for, for various things, there's an example of kind of a prototyping project where we were looking at um, just various simple web technologies to throw up early examples of early panoramas. And SeekBeak is one of them. I'll just put the SeekBeak link in there as well. And the interesting thing about SeekBeak is that it it kind of comes to the front of the pack of these this, this little selection of various um, simple panel, you know, simple um, 360 web tools because uh, it has so many different hotspot types. It's, like you said, it can link to um, Internet of Things. It's got, I think, three different... Um, well, I don't know what you call them, actually, just actions. It can get, put, and... Um, it can get, put, enter, and delete. And so with those, well, those four things, you can start to do some really basic scripting. And so it's not only thermostats and lights and things like that that you can interact with, but I'm sure that, you know, there's many different things that can have a little controller put on them. Cool. So we probably should move on um, from SeekBeak at this stage because we've we'll, um, got a couple of other tools we want to have a quick look at. Um, so if I just go back into screen sharing here. So thank you for those examples, Meredith and Mitch. Um, the next thing I wanted to have a look at, if I look at the right page, <laughs> uh, was Mozilla Hubs and Google Street View. So perhaps we'll go on to Street View because it's kind of, um, you know, aligned with what we've been doing with SeekBeak at this stage. Uh, so once again, I'll just put that link into the into the chat. Um, but if you click on the the uh, Street View link, it's basically gives you an overview. This is Google's page for uh, Street View. So I would assume that most people have actually use Street View. Uh, most people use Google Maps for navigating, particularly, you know, when they're going overseas and, and going to a new place. Um, and Street View is fantastic for getting an idea of what, you know, somewhere where you've never been before looks like. Um, but it's also a great way of creating your own 360 degree content uh, using the mobile app. The other thing that um, Google does is it has uh, as a way of almost gamifying the uh, user generated content. Um, you know, Google's all about harvesting your information, but um, a lot of their tools can be used like as a gamification of, of learning projects. And uh, their local guides links into Street View. So local guides basically give you um, 
a point scheme for you know how many photos you've contributed to to Google Street View or um, how many reviews you've done or ven venues that are on Google Maps, um, uh, whether you've uh, you know, contributed to reviews or corrected reviews, edited reviews, etc. And so, depending on your activity, um, you get these these points. And so, you could gamify an exercise with your students and and uh, get them to see who can get the most local guide points for a certain activity. Um, you can see I've just done one review, which is the Goldfish Bowl Bakery in in Armadale, um, just over a year ago. Uh, Here's my photo, which was uploaded um, my breakfast to the Goldfish Bowl Bakery. You can tell it's mine because my um, profile comes up. Um, here's another one of my photos. So uh, it's quite fun to be able to go through and check on venues, etc., and see the content that you've created and shared. You know, it kind of makes you feel good. Uh, and then also see the number of views. So every photo that's uploaded to Google Street View, you can see some of mine here. These are ranked by uh, views. Um, so you can change the ranking here by, by date or sort by views. Um, and what's cool about this is that um, I, I just take a few photos as you know, I go around the world at conferences, et cetera. Obviously nothing in the last year, but uh, seeing how many people have actually viewed your photos. Once again, a way of gamifying it. Who get, who's going to get the most views of the photo that they've shared on Google Street View or Google Maps? Um, and for some strange reason, almost half a million people have viewed my 360 photo of the University of Western Australia. Um, it's kind of a bit why, but uh, so here's my 360 degree Street View photo. And in this case, I actually used a 360 degree camera, and that's you can see a little bit of leftover of the 360 degree camera because it's taking a photo of everything with the dual lenses, but you get to see a little bit of it there. Um, and then there's me trying to look like I'm, you know, not doing anything, but I'm using Wi Fi to remotely capture the photo. And um, for some reason, almost half a million people have viewed that photo on Google Street View, which makes me feel good. So overall of my something like how many photos have I got there? I think something like 60, um, one and a half million views of my photos. Um, you know, so that, that's quite cool. But anyway, how do you create these? Well, it's really simple. Let me just go into screen mirroring here. So if you have your mobile smartphone what you do is you download the google street view app um, but what a lot of people don't realize is that you can use it to create your own content rather than just view google's content so just linking to my desktop here hopefully this comes up in a second Obviously, my connection is going quite slow today. So there's my iPhone. If I just go and open up the Street View app. And uh, because I've signed in before, it's automatically re-signed me in. So it's looking at my profile. Uh, and depending on where you're looking on the map, the, the photos that are available will change. So by default, it goes into explore mode. So you're looking at content that people have uploaded and um, Google will probably push towards you um, stuff that they're making some money off. But anyway, if you go into profile, these then are your photos, the ones that you have taken and uploaded, which um, may not be any to start with. But once again, as you move around the map, the photos that are coming up are now the photos that I have taken. And if I zoom in, for example, into the UK, a lot of the conferences I go to are in the UK and you can see most of them are in the Midlands, um, get to go to all the exciting places like Coventry for conferences, or used to. <laughs> and um, you can see my photos 
in Coventry if I bring them up. These are the ones that I've taken and it gives me some stats as well. So um, you can see outside Coventry Cathedral, I've got almost 400,000 views of that, uh, that image on Google Street View, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so to take an image, all you do is just click the little orange camera icon when you're in the app. And uh, you've got three options. So one is you can link directly to a Wi-Fi um, 360 degree camera. So if you own one, you're gonna get a much better um, photo. Um, so I generally use one of the cheapest ones around that it's an LG 360 cam. Uh, it's about $250 New Zealand. Um, but you know, any, any camera, well, not any camera, there's about uh, a dozen or so that are compatible with the Street View app and they're linked on the Google site. Uh, or if you've already taken a 360 degree photo that's saved on your device uh, in the camera roll, you can import it um, or you can click on the camera to activate the camera and start taking your 360 degree photo and you basically follow the dots and stitch it. So you're gonna to get to see my lovely workstation here. And as we move around, it uh, attempts to stitch things. You can see because my camera's moving a bit, it's gonna be pretty random sort of stitching because I'm pretty close to where I am. And uh, Solange will get to see one of my keyboards, except it's undercover. It's uh, Mox, uh, Mox X, 61 key. Maybe I should take the cover off to prove it, but anyway. Um, I only deal with the... Uh, with the old school stuff, the real, you know, pianos. Well, if I move right around here, you can see um, just in the background there. Oh, it's not going to stitch because I haven't got the my guitar, but anyway. So anyway, you get the idea. And uh, when you're happy, you, you click the, uh, the little um, tick box. And then what happens, as you can see, is the little man runs across the screen. Uh, and what they're doing is um, allow access to photos, stitching that photo together. And if I have a look at it, because I didn't finish it, it's going to look pretty naff. It's only you know, a little bit of stitched. Um, oh, there we go. It's featuring Mitch Buzzer. Okay. I should keep that one. Um, and then you can get to put a location on as well. Oops, I accidentally clicked publish. So now you're online, Mitch. Sorry about that. It probably won't get accepted by Google because it's only, only half a stitch, but anyway. Um, but you can see how quick and easy it is. And you also have a share icon. So you can share that. Um, if you're on an iPhone, you can airdrop it. Uh, you can copy the, the link to it, uh, message it, et cetera, mail it, save it to your camera roll, et cetera, et cetera. So very, very quick and easy. And uh, if I... It shows me on the map where I am, uh, which as you can see is Cambridge in New Zealand. So the map is contextual for where you've taken that photo. If I zoom out, it'll give you a bit of an idea of where that is in New Zealand. So what you can do, um, instead of, you don't have to publish that, um, actually it didn't publish online because um, it's in my private uh, mode thankfully. Um, so you're okay, Mitch. Um, so in the private tab are photos that you've taken, but you haven't published publicly yet. And what you can do with those, you don't have to publish your images to Street View. You can just save them to your camera roll on your device and then import those into your SeekBeak environment. So they don't even have to go on to um, Google Street View. You can just use it to create your content. So that's the lightning overview of using Google Street View to create some 360 degree content. Uh, and let me just really quickly show you one of my photos that I did with my camera, which I, I think I showed yesterday actually, as part of my tour um, was this one here. <clears throat> I quite like this. this is one of my favorite 360 degree photos I've taken with my with my camera. This is inside the shop tower in Melbourne. Hope you recognize that if you've ever been there. Um, 
I'm quite impressed with how it stitched. It stitched pretty well, and I did it pretty rapidly. Um, because I, as, I, as I explained yesterday, there was this guy standing in the background there who kind of looks like an angry crocodile dundee and I wasn't sure if I was upsetting him by taking his photo. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, it, it, it works really well, even just with your single lens on your, on your camera. So we were talking before about, um, uh, you know, ethics and copyright and Street View does give that option to smudge out faces if you, um, if you want to. So that's the quick, quick overview of Street View and local guides. Mitch. Can I ask you about the um, um, blurring of faces there? Is that done? I mean, you'd have to upload it for it to, to do that automatically, wouldn't you? Um, I think it's done in the app actually. Ah, that's good. And I think what all you do is you just um, basically rub your finger over the area that you want to smudge, um, whether that be a license plate or a, you know, a, a, um, a road sign or a face. So if you did upload them, do you know if there's any AI that looks for faces and number plates and blurbs? There must be some. I'm not sure if they look for faces and blurbs, but they certainly look for... Um, you know, decency, they have like a, um, any, yeah, any, and things like that. Yeah, 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 anything like that gets captured. I mean, there were some classic cases of like someone uploaded a, a photo of, uh, of an Android peeing on an apple, uh, <laughs> and that got, you know, um, taken down, etc. Um, so yeah, they do have some logic to, to capture dodgy stuff. And does get do you, know, do you know if um, you remove your images from Street View, do they, do they, you know, quite obviously get removed from the Street View database? I don't know, actually. They're probably cached somewhere, I would think. It's the nature of the internet. Um, but yeah, they, uh, they, they do try to modify behavior, like I said, with the with the local guides and giving you points. And if you do dodgy stuff, then your points get taken off. Um, and you can become um, what they call a, I can't remember if it's a, a licensed or a trust, I think it's called trusted Google Street View contributor. Um, they audit the content that you share and it has to be a certain quality and certain file size and use certain cameras uh, as well. Um, I think that so, system's down at the moment, Tom. Is it? That's what I heard recently. Is, is that trust photography thing is not currently in, in it being used by Google? Um, oh, okay. In the last few months, um, I'm not sure on that, but that's what I've seen on some of the 360 sites. There's been issues around how Google's been processing that. So they're still putting up images, but there's no. It hasn't been going from what a few people said. I, haven't, I, haven't, I yeah. haven't haven't been looking at it myself, but that's what I heard. Right. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, uh, things, um, you know, go up and down all the time, but um, that, that is supposed to be in place. So, yeah, just a quick overview of, of how students can create their own content. Uh, Meredith had to go, but uh, thanks for her for sharing. Tom, um, yeah, Sonia. I was just wondering to blur faces or uh, other stuff. Is it in the same app as Street View or you need to download another app? No, it's app? in the Street View app itself. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think that's uh, probably in the, in the, when you're in the private mode before you publish. Um, so if you have a look at, if you take a photo uh, and then look at it in your private um, mode and Street view, I'm pretty sure you get that option for blurring parts of the imagery there. Thank you. Okay. So next uh, topic I wanted to explore was Mozilla Hubs. I know Mitch is hanging out for that. Um, <clears throat> so Mozilla Hubs, do you want to give us a quick um, rundown? What's Mozilla Hubs, Mitch? I mean, you've had a fair bit of experience of it. Um, well, no, I don't want to break your flow, Thomas. Um, I haven't really had a lot of experience with it. I've just 
um, you know, kind of become an intermediate um, or a serial messer around her. <laughs> um, but I, I still think, you know, I've done, I've got, done a kind of comparison of the features of it with other things that are similar to it. And, you know, it just kind of holds the most promise, I think, out of, out of all of them. Yeah, I've, I've been quite impressed uh, with what I've seen. So this is the main um, site. It's, it's really quite simple. Um, basically, what you, if you sign in, the best way is to sign in so that or it remembers your preferences, etc. Um, <clears throat> you don't have to actually sign in to use Mozilla Hubs. You can do it anonymously as such. Um, but the key really is creating a room. Um, so I have created a room and I thought it'd be just a bit of fun for us all to have a bit of explore the same room rather than everyone randomly looking at different rooms and being there by themselves. So on the Padlet, let me just put this link into the text chat. This will take you to the Padlet where we're curating some of our examples uh, and some of the references, etc. Um, and you can see I've got a, a demo room which I've um, created. And uh, if you click on that, it should take you into it. Let me see, I've probably closed it in my browser, so I'll click on it to go into it again. So stage, when, when it's loading, um, it takes a few seconds to load. And depending on how complex your environment is, how many objects are, it can take a, take a while to load in your browser. <clears throat> Looks like Rich is going to uh, put his VR headset on to explore it that way. So when you get to the room, uh, you'll know you're in the right room because it has the name TL Bootcamp VR Meetup. Um, you can enter it on a device. So it goes into immersive mode and splits the screen. Um, you can spectate. I guess that means you, you're kind of invisible and just looking at other people. I haven't tried that mode. Or you can click on join the room. So when you go join the room, it'll ask you to access your microphone and test the audio. Um, it's interesting when we're doing a Zoom meeting at the same time because you're going to get audio twice. You're going to get the Zoom audio and you're going to get the Mozilla Hubs audio. So it's going to be a little bit weird. What happens with Mozilla Hubs audio is it's contextual. So when you're close to another avatar in the room, you will hear that person. When you're further away, you don't hear them. So it gives you actual contextual spatial sound. But because we're also in Zoom at the same time, we're not going to really get that effect unless you mute yourself in Zoom and only use the Hubs audio. So that's um, you might want to mute your uh, Zoom audio when you enter the room. So as you enter, the, I, I like this one because it takes you straight into uh, here are the controls. How do you navigate? So this particular room has the navigation and uh, someone is writing. So Dr. SG is writing currently. <laughs> And if I click on the people, I can see who's in here so far. Uh, so there's three people, well, two people in the lobby, which means that you're in the waiting room. You haven't actually gone into the environment yet. And there's two, two people in the room. So you can give yourself, change your name from the default names, which tend to be wacky names like Mandarin, etc. cetera. Um, if you give your avatar your real name, then people know who you are. So because I've created the room, I get the control of muting, etc. If you click the G key, you can fly rather than just uh, walk. So you can get around a bit quicker and jump between levels. You can see I've customized this environment a little, not a whole lot. I've put my own QR code there, which is actually um, a link to the feedback survey. I've put a couple of icons, custom icons, and I've put um, the flyer for the bootcamp on the wall. So you do that in the editor interface, which is 
Mozilla spoke, which we'll, we'll get on to. If I go out of fly mode, now I'm bitten back into walking. Yeah, you can go underneath the model too. Someone's put into the, uh, Salons has put into the chat. Um, but if, if you've done any gaming, any computer gaming, the interface should be pretty intuitive. It uses your default keys, forward, W, S, back, A, uh, left, D, right. And then of course you move around, look around with your mouse um, and you can jump by clicking your mouse uh, right mouse button somewhere and sort of jump to a space kind of quicker and uh, jump around if you want to move around quicker. So we've got one person still in the lobby. Probably uh, setting up your avatar, whoever that is. Is that Mitch? You're muted. I'm just trying to log in on the computer I've got next to it, so. Okay. So what would happen is um, if I didn't have my Zoom audio going at the same time, um, because I'm standing next to whoever .sba, .sba is, is that you, Sonia, or is that Solange? It's me, me Tom. Ah, Stuart Barber. There we go. Um, I would hear Stuart and uh, no one else because we're, we're next door to each other. Um, I haven't gone past the Padlet. I can't find the link on Padlet. Where is it? Uh, okay, let me just go back to my Padlet. It's the one that says Mozilla Hub's demo room. It's under shared examples. So you probably have to scroll that down a bit to see it, workshop day two, and click on Mozilla Hub's demo room. Okay, okay, thank you, I got it. Cool. Is that uh, Dr. SG, is that Solange? You can place objects into the room. Um, if you yes. click on place, place. Um, or you can share, share your screen, share your camera. And so now you can see my webcam and see what I really look like inside Mozilla hubs and you can move objects around. If you mouse over them, hold the space bar, you can resize, you can pin it into the room, delete them, move them around, etc. So it's a relatively simple interface, um, which I think is part of the key because you want to you want to keep it simple uh, to get people on board. Depending on the uh, the template, you can do things like uh, they have some hints on how you can pin your own content, your photos. Um, so by pinning items. It means that they stay even if you leave the room. So by default, if you leave the room, any content that you've added into that virtual room disappears when you leave the room. Mm. So I can see Stefan's reading the uh, virtual notice there. And so nothing is saved in terms of the interactive content? Um, I think you can, you can... Um, I think that it has links to stream to Twitch if you wanted to record the whole, um, you know, uh, what's happening. Um, you can take photos and snapshots. Um, if you pin objects, they stay inside the room um, when you leave. So things like the, the QR code that I added there, I didn't add that in the editor. I just pinned it in, um, when I was in the room last. and it stayed there. Um, and, and those items will stay there until the creator of the room closes the room. Uh, so because they haven't actually closed the room as such, it's effectively still open and anyone with the link can jump back into it. Of 
course, you can customize your avatar. Um, you can, to a certain extent, I mean, they're, they're a little bit limited, but uh, from the default ones, but you can create much more interesting avatars and bring them in in a third party editor. One of the features of this particular room, um, if you get close to it and you go to uh, a, a place, click on the place icon and uh, you can upload um, some media. There's actually a media frame, which currently my QR code is in. Um, so users can uh, place into that media frame, which if you click on it there, a big blue line comes up um, and you can place in there a photo or a video, which then is displayed on the stage for the other participants. Can you live stream? Yes, you can have your camera, your webcam live. Um, you can share your screen. Um, you could, you know, if you're doing, uh, say, a YouTube live session, you can bring that in, into the space as well. So you could have a virtual performance here. And would there be any latency issues or things like that? Oh, bound to be. <laughs> <laughs> <What's> that? <laughs> well, that would make that you know that's part of the uh the fun and the creativity i think <clears throat> and of course with, with being able to yeah with being able to fly you always get the uh get someone who decides to fly to the very edge of the uh the area as well and when I mean, i've done this before with other people they fly off randomly to the end of the the virtual world um <laughs> But, you know, it's, it's part of the experience. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six people uh, in this room. It should support at least about 25, hopefully. It's a relatively large space. And the idea of using this space was that you could have small groups of people perhaps virtually meeting in different areas of this, this hall and have like little breakouts little chat sessions happening as people, you know, move around it. Um, and there's a whole range of different, this is just a preset environment. Uh, if I go into the more, um, I can change things like my name and avatar. I can make this room a favorite. I can uh, close the room if I wanted to. I could change the room into a different room. Um, you can put links between rooms so if you look at the top of the stage there, you might not have noticed it, but there's a link. And if you click on that, it takes you into another um, hall. Um, but you'll be there by yourself if you do that <laughs> at this stage. So you can link multiple environments, as we were saying before, if you get more than 25 people and you're maxing out, you know, it's starting to fall over. If you put links to other rooms, then people can sort of move between the rooms and and uh, interact that way as well. Sorry, Tom, I'm a bit behind. I can't get to this room. Like I can't get to any room. Like I'm outside, how do I go in? Like You're in the lobby. So yeah. if I click on people, uh, that must be you. Um, there should be an enter room button that's right in the middle of the screen. Unless you're beyond the maximum number of people allowed in the room, um, you should be able to get in. I can see this staircase sign or I... 
Maybe you could try clicking the link to join again if it's not letting you actually enter. Yeah. Does it have anything to do with the invite thing which I see on left side, like room code or embed code? Or Sorry, you're a little bit quiet. I couldn't quite hear what you're saying. So there's an invite thing on left hand side. Uh, Okay, so there, there is also a code. Um, I didn't think you needed it for that link, but uh, this is the room code. I'll put it into the chat in case you do need it. So how was that in the headset, uh, Mitch? Um, I've got you on Zoom, on the audio on Zoom. It, it didn't work. I'm not sure why. Um, it kept... Um, jamming on just rendering only a small portion of the, the world. Okay. So I had a couple of goes and then abandoned it just for the sake of time. Sure. Okay. Well, we probably better jump out of the room at this stage. Um, I'm just going to leave the room. It won't close the room. I won't close it. It'll, it'll still be there. Someone must be standing close to me. I'm getting feedback. There we go. It's Mitch. <laughs> so if we just jump back out of the room and uh, back into Zoom. <clears throat> well, you're all in Zoom still anyway. Um, yeah, normally what you would do is you would obviously mute yourself on Zoom and then just have the hubs audio <clears throat> running, but because we're doing a bit of a tutorial, we had both running. So the key thing with um, the uh, hubs is really being able to create and edit your own environment. So I've got a link there to the spoke environment. So the spoke environment is what they call the editor. And if you click on that, it'll take you in, into the edit mode. Once again, I've signed in. So you can see there's my modified version of that hall that I was playing around with in the editor. Um, when you create a new project, you can choose from any of the defaults that are available and just modify them. Um, you can even, once you've created your own one and you like it, you can copy and duplicate it and then just edit bits of it if you want to. And you can have multiple versions of that room. And like I said before, you can link between them. Uh, so you can create like virtual art galleries, etc., and link between them or virtual music spaces, etc. I'm just a question on that. If you can have a if you can have a maximum number of people in each room, what happens if people then move between rooms and, and max out a particular room, like moving between? Obviously, you can have too many in one space. How, yeah, how does you that probably need some sort of like booking or something, way of, of booking a space. Okay. I guess how you manage that's kind of um, you know, up, up to you, but uh, you could do it in different ways. Um, so this is the, 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 the editor and the simplest way is just to edit um, a preset. And if I click on objects in the um, actual space itself, then the editing features pop up. So in this case, this is a media frame. Um, which allows people to pop in their own media into that and um, display it on that on that stage there. So that's what the QR code that I popped in there. Um, so you get various options, like you can define what type of media is allowed to go into that frame. And, and this for me is quite interesting because a, a media frame like that allows the user, the person that's in that room to be, you know, have some sort of input into that room rather than it just being uh, a preset video that, that you've created or whatever. Um, so then it actually becomes quite powerful that people can share their own content within that environment, um, getting away of just replicating what we can do in a physical room anyway, and uh, go from a presentation mode into a, you know, a user collaboration space. So that media frame allows me to put in 2D, 3D, uh, only images, only videos, only PDFs, and I've chosen all media. So uh, any of those types of media can be put into that frame and, and sort of highlighted. Um, these other 
elements. These were already there. I've just put my own content into them. And um, what you do is to put your own content is, um, you have this My Assets, uh, and basically you upload your content. So it uploads to the server. So that's things like you know, small videos. You don't want them to be large videos, uh, images, etc. And uh, once you've uploaded them there, um, you can just, if, you, if you're on the template, you just select the area that you want to put them into, copy the um, URL. So if I click on here, um, I can either place it around somewhere um, or I can um, find the actual copy the URL of that uh, item that's been uploaded to the server. And then I can click on where I want it to go and then paste it into uh, that URL and then it appears in my, um, my virtual world. So it's pretty easy to modify and edit. Um, and if you want to, you know, go crazy and create your own environments, the, it, it's, it's a very simple um, interface. So you just basically choose the type of object that you want to um, place uh, and define and edit and move it in where you want within the room. Uh, and then of course, when you want to actually use that, um, you can uh, open in Hub. So it's basically just testing it. Um, when you're wanting to use that and share it, you publish it to Hubs and it ends up in your, your list of projects. And uh, then you can use that to create a room. Instead of using the default templates, you use your own custom made template to create the room and then share it via the, the sharing link. So that's the, the quick overview of hubs. So this is really interesting, Thomas, because, you know, you're bringing in these other elements now of um, the affordances of teaching spaces and, and how do they kind of map over from what we know in the real world, where you can have flexible furnishings and you know changing the dynamic of the room can change the um, changing the layout of the room. Sorry, can change the dynamic of the yep. of the room. And you know, surely there are some affordances or some you know dynamics that exist in virtual spaces that um, we can't really explore in the real world due to yeah, and I would hope that uh, that's what we end up doing rather than just replicating what we can do physically anyway, because it's kind of like, then, well, what's the point? Unless we're like COVID-19 and we can't meet physically. Um, yeah, I, I think you're definitely right there, Mitch. Um, what, what is there that we can do with these virtual spaces that we just can't do uh, in the physical real world? I've also There's found uh, exploring different spaces um, change the way people interact as well so like uh, you know jumping everyone into a small conference room where suddenly all the avatars are all close together um, completely changes that the way people interact as well and, and uh, you, you quickly get bored because what you're replicating there is like a, a meeting space a very small meeting space and so it's you can't play people don't feel free to you know start popping in items and start drawing on the wall and stuff like they did in the larger space um, so, you know, it, it's funny how even the changing the virtual space changes how people interact within that space as well. There's another issue with hubs that I think it's worth just sharing with everyone is um, you can search on Sketchfab, I think, still with um, in the edit mode. And so it, it allows you to bring in a whole bunch of... Um, um, pre-made things that are low polygons you know they're really kind of blocky and and chunky and that means you can have you know a kind of a, a, a pre-built environment that doesn't add a lot of um, overhead to to the to the um, teaching space but many of the models that we want to use in a tertiary setting kind of necessarily are very high quality and you want to be able to go right up to the surface of things and inspect the surface. And I'm thinking here of some really high quality photogrammetry that we've done with um, Egyptian relics. And so the two things just can't 
can't play nicely at the moment. Yeah, yeah, I think that's where something like Roslyn has, you know, perhaps a lot of potential. I don't know whether Roslyn has the capability to do something like Hubs. Well, you mentioned before that Hubs has a kind of a locally hosted version. I haven't encountered that before. Yeah, it's like WordPress. You can effectively download the uh, the Hub software and uh, host it on your own server. So that might be another way of doing it as well. If it's you know hosted on a fast local server with you know big bandwidth to it over the local network, then that's a way of getting around that. Because I'm I'm interested in this idea of people using a virtual space, but they're in the same physical space. Have you, have you seen and, some of the stuff that Matt Bauer did with that? He did, did some stuff right. around that three or four years ago. Uh, if you look up Matt Bauer, B-O-W-E-R, he's currently in Macquarie. Yeah. Um, but him and I think Gregor probably was involved in, in that. Uh, they, they did a couple of projects where they basically merged the virtual and the real world. So, you know, a group of students in a physical studio space, um, also interacting at the same time in a virtual space. Interesting. Uh, I'm not sure if I've got that, that reference on file, but um, Matt Bauer, B O W E R. Okay, I'll look it up. Um, similar question to before, Tom. You know that there, again, I, I've, because Ben showed me those, that 360 view of Melba Hall. So I don't know what you call that, a 360 video of Melba Hall um, up in Parkville that the university now has. So, you know, obviously the, the obvious idea would be to stick a student uh, or a group of students up on the stage and get them to, to sort of imagine that they're there. Um, but my question would be, in a place like Mozilla Hubs, could you import a real high quality 360 No, space? you have to reproduce it in the... Um in the spoke engine, um, you know, as best as you could type of thing. Um, you potentially can, Solange, um, but because I want to do something very similar to what you're, you're describing. I want to work with um, models that, that are potentially painted in tilt brush or gravity sketch or something like that. And so because they're freehand, they often have lots and lots of um, structure to them, lots of um, polygons. Yeah, and you've got to um, go through a process called decimation, and mm. this is exactly where it departs from. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's something that I know I have to learn how to do, but I, I can't become I can't become a, um, a technical pro at decimating models because I imagine there's so much to it. I mm. just don't even know. Does, does, has anyone else had experience with that? No. No, I, I guess, yeah, like, like you, Mitch, I guess my approach to educational technology is um, keep it simple and make it easy entry level without having become, you know, spending weeks or years learning how to drive the thing. Um, it's, it's like, you know, me with computers and mobile devices for me, they, they, this predominantly a creative tool. Um, when the tool starts getting in the way just to keep it running, um, then that's for me is when I forget it. So you know, that's why I'm a Mac user or you know, an <laughs> iOS user. And I, not that I haven't used Windows and, and Android, but um, for me, they're much more of a creative tool than, than spending, you know, ages trying to troubleshoot something that's not going to work. There is a tool that does it called Mesh Mixer, and Ben Cronin showed me how to do it once. But I think you can—it's like putting something into a, um, you know, a shrinkinator. Basically, if you put something that's beautiful and ornate into one end, and then push the decimate button without really knowing what you're doing with the levers and dials, yeah. you get a kind of a lump out the other end. And that was going to be my suggestion too, Mitch, um, is that uh, when I had that same problem, what my go-to was to go and see Ben and ask for his <laughs> advice and help um, on that, having seen his work in Wilson Hall and, um, you know, the, the Chancellor's building and all the other kind of, you know, things like that. Certainly, there's a strong case for having 
a limited number of people with really high expertise that you can seek assistance from. Not that Ben's got enough time to do that everywhere, but um, yeah. Yeah, so I think that's part of one, one of the tips would be create a team uh, around a project. So it's not you having to do all the work, but team up with people with the right skills. Uh, and that, that's the way to approach it. So if you need app design or, you know, high end video editing, then get someone with those skills on the team um, rather than think, oh, well, suddenly I have to learn how to do that myself. It might take years. Um, certainly, I think there's a lot of potential around, as, as I said the other day, around LiDAR and um, oh, the inbuilt LiDAR scanners on, on iPhones and iPads. And, uh, you know, it's going to move to Android as well. But uh, so suddenly you can create those scans just like you do with Street View with the camera. You can create a 3D environment map uh, incredibly quickly with a, with a LiDAR scanner on your phone and then bring that into an environment. The key, once again, is um, how large are those files? Because there's there's so many elements, so many dots. They're huge files, but you know it's it's um, processing power. And obviously, if you can do it on an iPhone now, um, you can hopefully do it on a desktop or a laptop. We need quantum computing now. Yeah. <laughs> yep, or we'll make life quicker. The real one or the other. <laughs> so that's pretty much what I wanted to go over today, really. Um, really a brief introduction, just give people some ideas, give them some hints, maybe just point them where they might want to uh, have a look, what, what may be relevant for them to, to check out, depending on their context. Um, so that, that's kind of the, the lightning overview. Uh, I think if people want to take this further, then, then certainly be keen to collaborate on projects and maybe uh, um, be part of development teams, you know, create that interactive virtual concert hall uh, solange. Um, but, you know, just build a team around a project like that. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, Mitch, myself, and maybe Stuart and Ben and a few others would be keen to be involved, uh, depending on time commitments, etc. Would you like me to just show the interactive interaction screen for our KR Pano, Tom, just to demonstrate what that looks like. As a, yeah, that sounds I'm good. I'm not sure if others have seen it. I'll just try and share my screen. Hang on. It says I'm disabled on that at the moment, Tom. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Tom. Here we go. Make co-host. Thank you. So hopefully it usually takes few seconds to load up because my Wi-Fi is pretty terrible. Um, so let me know when that you can actually see a uh, Caliard. Yep, that's there. So on, on our screen, this is, so this is the standard sort of 360 photo, which again, there's normally some lag going through Zoom on this, but we have a, a panel uh, on this where we have hotspots. So those little green dots you can see in the top left-hand side of the screen um, are hotspots that move you around the farm. So if I click on one of those, it takes me to a different spot um, on the property. And similarly, we have this top left panel, um, which when I click on that, that then moves me through time. Um, alternatively, so if I clicked on that, we'll just, I'll go through to summertime so the grass changes color. Um, and similarly down the bottom, the other ways of moving around are through um, window panes so you can physically see the scene you're moving to. Um, and also a lot of other interaction elements. In this case, it's rainfall and temperature. Um, we add in some other things in there as well. We also have a, a glossary version of this, which applies hotspots throughout the entire um, process. So this sort of setup, I guess, in general can work for a whole range of things. So if you're looking in a, a music building, it might be having several rooms with different practice sessions or you know, whatever it might be. So you can insert either 360 video um, or flat screen video um, into this. So if I just um, I'll find one, bear with me for a second, I can find an example of that, which might be, sorry, I just need to get rid of that. Jump out of there. So I'll just let that load up. Once hopefully you'll be able to see a sheep, a sheep yard shortly. Um, 
So in this one, this was just the first 360 we did back in 2012 when we we're using six GoPros to stitch together video back in the good old days. Um, if I click on to that, then what will hopefully happen um, in the course of time is that what you'll see, if, it, if this will go through Zoom, is um, a 360 video playing, which is struggling on my PC at the moment because of Wi-Fi. Um, but it lets you insert um, a whole range of different file types, I guess, into it. So there's a whole lot you can do. Again, this isn't playing right at the minute, but um, in a standard environment, this plays quite happily through, through Wi-Fi. I'll just shut that down, otherwise it might kick me out of Zoom. Uh, bear with me, it'll stop screen sharing. So that, that um, platform is available for other people at the University of Melbourne to use, Stuart? So look, at the moment, that site is a... So it hasn't been uh, released any, white, any more widely than ag and, and um, that resigns just because we're working with private farmers and we didn't want them to um, get harassed by people who didn't believe in farming, uh, which has been a problem, I guess, in the past. So it's still mm -hmm. a resource used within there, but we are looking at trying to, or certainly I'm looking at trying to get Dookie VR published as a, a broad scale resource to looking at taking into primary schools, secondary schools as an educational, as a first test run with, with that. So we have that developed, um, but I need to go through and actually work more with some primary and secondary schools to get that brought in there. So at, at that point, I can see it being used more widely once I get the, um, the tick off to actually do it, which is a, a bit of a process. But what about as a actual development uh, platform for other projects? So um, most everything or the majority of stuff that's in there is really from the, the um, uh, KR Pano uh, site and then there's some code in the background to let um, for example a, a glossary version overlay that with a PHP database and um, other insertions onto it um, so we'd always be happy to chat about that but it's not something that's as I guess an open source at this point right. in time so, um, so, so it was a customized mashup effectively correct so I was trying to use as much as we could off the shelf but then Evan who works with me on that did the bulk of the of the other things to bring those components together to make it more usable from a student interface point of view. Have you done a uh, comparison with 3D Vista Pro? So look, 3D Vista Pro certainly has some advantages in, in 360 video from my point of view, Mitch, and so I am looking at going into using it. I just haven't outlaid the cash for it yet because I haven't had time to use it, but I, I intend to start using 3D Vista because it is really good for, in particular, 360 video. Um, but again, we can run 360 video through KR Pano as well. And it's um, because we started with that back in 2012, um, it's been a logical one to, to keep with at this point in time. Um, but the, the video, certainly, I can see quite a few scenarios where, where um, Vista will be really useful for what we want to do. Um, LE have a, um, have a um, license of 3D Vista Pro. Yep. And... So they were open to um, sharing that license because yeah. one, one of the good things about 3D Vista Pro is you can develop your whole project, um, you know, completely unhindered without a license. And then when you come to export for real, you can, you just have to apply a license code. So that, that makes it really useful across the university, I think. Yeah, it's quite a different yeah. licensing model, isn't it? Yeah. And so I've talked to Ben about, about that, and I say, and, but until I'm actually got enough time to develop it, there's no, no real yeah, sense worrying too much about it. But look, certainly the 360 video, so we're now doing a lot more 360 video. So this year, I'm hoping once I start getting back out in the field again to do a lot more 360 video. So we're now set up to start doing that um, at a slightly higher level. And, and depending how that goes, I might go to the next level up with a Instapro 2 or something as well. Yeah, yeah, so that's one of the limitations of, of uh, Seekbeak as a platform is that it doesn't do video. It only does the 360 spherical uh, imagery. Yep. Um, there are other web platforms that do let you do video. There's uh, All Media, um, which also does AR and 3D models. It's actually an Australian company, but um, most of their clients are uh, US. Uh, and then, of course, you go up to other uh, editing environments like Unity. Um, the issue being, you know, the the uh, level of knowledge to edit the interface and stuff like that. Um, 
So it, it depends what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. Hey, well, thank you. And uh, thank you very much, Mitch, for um, you know, all your sharing all your knowledge with us and, and Stuart, your uh, fantastic examples. It's been great. Uh, Solange and Sonia for sticking with us. Um, there is one thing I'd be keen, which is um, I've got a QR code for a feedback survey at the end there, uh, which you can, you can see there. There's also a link, uh, which is a Qualtrics survey, which, um, you know, if you've got five minutes to give us some feedback, that would be awesome. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So um, apart from that, thank you everyone for turning up and interacting. Thanks, Tom. It's been great. Thanks, Tom and everyone. That's been awesome. Cool. Fantastic. See you all again. See ya. See ya. Bye, Thank folks. You. Bye.